All right, I think we're ready to get started with our second part. Um, I think some of you are forgetting to pray for our computer and our camera <laughs> and the live stream. So next time, if you would pray for those, uh, if you want to drop your plates off or get a cup of tea, go ahead and we'll be... Oh, I was going to get a paper to sign up. Er, there's some papers here. Aha! Uh -huh. Would you... the uh okay sorry about that they're going to make us um patty landman's table and the duns and what's your name yeah, pat they're going to make a uh, calendar for the food upcoming so uh, they'll work on that and then we can pass it around we'll do the tuesdays in october and november there's enough of us that if you've signed up already, you probably don't need to sign up again. Um, okay. But if you want to, we won't, we won't uh, object. <laughs> All right. Yes, the cheese was good. And it's nice to have variety. So if you looked at the questions... Uh, that I had today, were there any that were particularly stumping? <laughs> You're not supposed to say all of them. You make me feel bad. Um, I would encourage you with a couple of things. The first one is that um, they are meant to be kind of thinking questions, to chew on the text. And if you're not used to doing that, if you're not used to really trying to dig into it, it can be hard. I, I readily admit that. Sometimes it's hard for me. But that kind of intellectual work using our brains is part of, you know, staving off dementia and Alzheimer's. So I'm doing you a medical favor. I'll send the bill in the mail. Uh, no, but it is like the more you use your brain and try and use these higher level intellectual things, uh, it actually can reverse signs of aging. That's scientific. But it's also because we, it's also because of the scriptures themselves are worth chewing on. I told one table, but I think it's good to repeat to everyone. There's a lot of them that I write where there's not necessarily a right answer. There's not like one thing to look for or one thing like, oh, this is exactly what Father wants. It's that um, to think about the people and the places and the times and to start trying to round out the story. Like the difference between seeing something in two dimensions and seeing something in three dimensions. Or if you've heard, like, you can look at a painting, but like this on the left would be called a bas-relief, that there's some depth to it. And because there's depth to it, it has more character. There's a richness to a picture or a sculpture or whatever it is, plaster, probably cast or something, but there's a richness to it when there's a depth to it. That's kind of what we want to try and do with the scriptures, is to take them from being flat, like we read the Bible and nod our heads and it's great, to we read the Bible, but we understand there's characters and there's times and there's themes and there's development and there's a richness to it that isn't always apparent at first. And this really will show up in the Gospel of John and it will save you all kinds of headaches because 
these themes become essential. So we talked last time about the importance of the phrase, the word became flesh. Oh, do you have a question? Yes. Okay, we're going to get there, but you should know the answer. Well, I, I wrote down the relationship now means that Mary is the disciple of Jesus, and the mediatrix between Jesus and us. Can you you can, what she's sure. So she's asking about the last one. Why, what is the deeper significance of Jesus calling Mary woman at the wedding feast at Cana? And she mentioned about Mary being mediatrix and a different relationship with Jesus. I think that's one direction to take it. But remember at the beginning of the Gospel of John, how does it start? In the beginning was the Word. And it goes back to Genesis. And who is the woman of Genesis? Eve. Eve. And so this is exactly what I mean. When you have that theme, and you remember, like, this started with the book of Genesis. And still, by the time we get to the beginning of the second chapter, all of a sudden, John pulls out this relatively cryptic phrase. And Mary is called woman. Well, what is that for? You know, if I called my mother woman, I think I'd get smacked. <laughs> Right? I don't have a wife, so I don't have to worry about that one. <laughs> but, but you see, as soon as you remember that context, and you remember, like this was kind of the book of Genesis, and John is going to have seven days like the book of Genesis, and they tend to happen very quickly here at the beginning of the Gospel. If you see that, I think you see his primary reference. When, John, when Jesus calls Mary woman, he's calling her the new Eve. And the question is much more than meets the eye. Because what Jesus is sort of asking Mary is, do you know what this means? If we start this, this ends in one spot. Do you know what it means? Like, this is a beginning, and it's a good beginning, and it's something that Jesus wants to do. But it also means the cross. Once it begins, it doesn't stop. And so when Jesus calls Mary woman, I would argue that the primary reference is to that of Mary as the new Eve. That Jesus is the new Adam, and that this is going to be a work of, of restoration and new creation that echoes the book of Genesis. And the reason why I would say that so strongly is because at the beginning of this gospel, it's been Genesis, 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 Genesis. And it's going to stay Genesis. We talked about in the beginning and light and dark. And here it talks about light and truth when John comes on the scene. There's all of these themes from Genesis that it's been gathering together. And so when you get to the second chapter, I would argue it doesn't switch. And you have to remember, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden are husband and wife. They're married. You know, and all of a sudden you have Jesus as a new Adam and Mary as a new Eve in an odd story where the bride and the groom basically don't show up. Right? It only mentions them once, toward the end of the story. So you see, there's all of this literary context, but that theme, if you grab on to Genesis and you keep that in mind, it will help you solve a lot of problems. There's other people in the book of Genesis that are really important too. Like if we were to go back to the book of Genesis, so the beginning is Adam and Eve in creation and seven days in the fall, and the prophecy of the Messiah ultimately coming, the one who will smash the head of the serpent. Who is the next important person in the book of Genesis? Chapter 6. Noah. It starts raining. 
Noah is the man of the covenant who follows the Lord. Who is the person after Noah? You can skip a few chapters. Next comes, yes, Abraham. Abraham shows up, I think, in chapter 10, and he occupies a while. And then it's Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob. And remember, Abraham has three different times he enters into these covenants with God. One of them is the weird one where he splits all the animals in half and this smoking fire pot goes between them. One of them happens when he sacrifices or when he's going to sacrifice Isaac on Mount Moriah. That will become very important, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob is the father of how many sons? Twelve where the 12 tribes come from, the sons of Jacob. Um, he sort of, the Bible gets kind of funny because one sort of dies and then ends up in Egypt and Jesus is going to go to Egypt. Like all of the major high points of the story of the book of Genesis are going to show up in the Gospels. Not all of the details are going to show up, but in a sense, one of the things that the New Testament does is I think it teaches you how to read the Old Testament. And if you pay attention to it, it will guide you to what the early Christians were reading because they'll be using it either as quotes or as a theme. Does that make sense? So it's sort of like the Cliff Notes version of the Old Testament. What is most important? And you have Adam and Eve and creation. You have Noah, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes, and the journey to Egypt. And then in the book of Exodus, we've talked a lot about Mount Sinai and Moses and the burning bush and crossing the Red Sea. And you see, when you start putting it together this way, you get a story arc that guides you through the Old Testament, and it does it by the references that they have in the New Hopefully that makes a little sense, and it's like putting on a set of glasses. Once you, start <clears throat> once you start thinking this way, once you start looking for it, I can promise you you'll see more of it. Like, a good question to ask yourself is, where does this sound like it's coming from in the Old Testament? And you probably won't get them all yourself. That's why we have a commentary. That's why you can look at other things like Catholic study Bibles, um, the Bible from Ignatius Press. Scott Hahn did one. We've talked about some of those other resources. If you want some people to help assist you. But once you kind of get it and you get these hooks, it'll be easier. I promise. Those who have, are in a second Bible study with me already, you probably have learned a few of them that the Gospels use more than once. So John shows up we're back at the incarnation of the word, that section on the bottom of page 12. John shows up and he starts talking about the Father and the Son. The one who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. And again, in English, we have to sort of break our English brains and put this back to where it was or where it should be because it just sounds plain and boring in English, but what he's actually saying is Jesus is divine and eternal. The one who comes after me, to come after someone is a motif or a phrase that means who is a disciple of. It means that Jesus was probably in the crowds listening to John preach for some days or at least some amount of time before he is declared to be the Christ before there's this public revelation. So the one who comes after me ranks ahead of me. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. That's another rabbinical reference to um, a student, a disciple and a teacher, a disciple and a master, a disciple and a rabbi. So John is clearly the one who's preaching and teaching at the beginning, but he's already claiming that Jesus is the rabbi. He's unknown and he's hidden, but he's already the teacher. He's already the master because he existed before me. It's talking about the eternity of God. 
From His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Now, we have to tackle a puzzle in the Gospel of John, and this is one of the major themes, so it's worth spending a little bit of time with. I would propose to you that the Gospel of John is entering into an argument about what it means to be truly Jewish. This Gospel is going to tackle the Old Testament and it's asking the question, what does it mean to be Jewish? How do you usually become Jewish in ancient Israel and in the modern world? Circumcision. Well, circumcision would be the sign of it, especially for men. But if even before that, how do people become Jewish? You're born into it. It's thought of as something that is part of the flesh. Not in a bad sense of the word, but it's based on who your parents are. If your parents were Jewish, you're Jewish. Right? So the people of Israel is this covenant family of God that isn't so evangelical like Christianity is, but is based on a recognition of descent, descent in the flesh. They kept a record of genealogies, right? So here you have the contrast, you hear it in the language. He, in Him, we have seen the fullness of God, and we have received grace upon grace. You have Jewish flesh and worldly descent, and you have heavenly grace. Who is going to be the father of Israel? Who is the father of the nation? We are children of Abraham. And we're children of Abraham because we are descended from Abraham? The New Testament says, no, descent matters not. It's not a question. It's not about who your father is. You're children of Abraham when you imitate his faith. Abraham is our father in faith. When you follow what Abraham did, which was believe in God and believe in a promise that he could not see, then you're a child of Abraham. That's not like flesh and genealogy and descent from father to son or from mother to daughter, those kind of things. Do you see the contrast a little bit? So John is going to enter into this debate about what it means to be truly Jewish. And John and the New Testament are going to claim that being Jewish is not about flesh. Being Jewish is about grace. Grace that comes through faith, imitating Abraham and his faith. And so there's this contrast that's set up in the gospel. There are times where you will feel it. Like Jesus is going to get into a debate with the Pharisees in a few chapters and say, you are not children of Abraham. You are children of your father, the devil. It's pretty strong words coming from Jesus, right? But he's entering into this debate about what it means to be truly Jewish. The one who is Jewish follows the commandments of God in their heart. The one who is Jewish lives in a covenant with God. Not the one who is Jewish has the temple in Jerusalem. That's what a lot of people think. Oh, we're part of the chosen people. We have the temple. God has chosen us. We're so much better than everyone else. God can destroy temples rather easily. It's not about flesh and blood, but about grace and truth. It's about faith. It's about living in a covenant with Him. Now, note that this isn't claiming that there aren't some people who are Jewish according to the flesh, who Jesus will also say are true Jews. Do you see that like the category isn't necessarily exclusive, it's just different. So there's people that are Jewish, like Mary and Zechariah and Elizabeth, who show themselves to be true children of Israel, true Jews, because they live in a covenant with God. And Jesus says the sign of living in the truth of this covenant is you find him. To be Jewish is to find him. 
Search the scriptures and you will read about me. So there are true Jews who are children of Israel, who are children of Abraham according to the flesh, but there are also other people that are Jewish because they imitate the faith of Abraham, not according to the flesh, but according to the way that they follow him in faith. Is this making at least a little bit of sense? But you can see, like, this language is sprayed out across the New Testament. It shows up in Paul. It shows up all over the place. And John is going to be in the middle of it. And if you know that the New Testament is doing this, it will save you nightmarish debates with people. Because so often with Protestants, particularly evangelical Protestants, they start talking about this thing of faith and works. Right? Faith and works, faith and works. It's all over St. Paul. Faith and works. What does it mean? Faith in Jesus Christ and works of the law. Are you saved by the sacrifices in the temple? Or are you saved by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross? The entire New Testament argues Jesus on the cross, not sacrifices in the temple. All kinds of people read it as if it's a modern English word and it's talking about works like things that Christians do. And it's the completely wrong context. It's all about this debate about what it means to be Jewish. And it, once you see that and you're like, really? Yep, go back and read the Gospels. You will find this all over the place. So then you read St. Paul and you're like, this makes so much sense. Why did they complicate it? Like, why did they take all of these words and these concepts that are actually explained word for word in the Bible and they took it and they threw it in a blender and screwed it all up? And I don't know. I don't know the answer to that anymore because when you read the New Testament, you will see this. You will feel it in the Gospel of John. There's this debate about what it means to be Jewish. What it means to be Jewish is about faith and living in a covenant with God. It's the same claim that Jesus will make to live in a covenant with God in Him. Okay, so John shows up. This is the next section, the first day of Revelation. So John shows up and he says, I'm a voice crying out in the wilderness. Oh, and we're gonna, darn it. Okay, well, we have to talk about another puzzle because um, John calls himself a voice crying out in the wilderness. And does anyone remember the Jewish group that it echoes? The Essenes. Yes, the Essenes on the north shore of the Dead Sea, where John the Baptist was probably baptizing. And some of you who weren't here before probably are asking, who are the Essenes? And this is the puzzle that we have to talk about. And it's not in the notes, so uh, I apologize because I knew we would have to talk about it at some point and I didn't realize it was coming this fast. So there's four major Jewish groups at the time of Jesus. The Essenes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Zealots. The four major groups at the time of Jesus. Essenes, Sadducees, Pharisees, and Zealots. The Zealots are probably the easiest ones to talk about. One of Jesus' apostles is from this group. He's called who? Nope, Peter's not. Peter was a fisherman. Simon, Simon the Zealot. It says that in some of the lists of the apostles. So one of the apostles was from this group. The Zealots were those who were filled with zeal for the house of God, they were those who were willing to use violence to attack the Romans. And so the most famous group of zealots were called the Sicarii. You don't really need to know this, but it means the dagger carriers. They would come up to Romans like during festivals. Remember that Jews wore long robes and they'd have daggers under their robes and they'd walk up behind them and they'd stab them and then try and fade into the crowd. They're the ancient version of terrorists. 
So that partially explains some of the tensions with the Romans. If every time the Jews get together and there's festivals and you end up with riots in the streets and soldiers who are dead and bleeding on the ground, that would cause some tension. That's what happens it, at the time of Jesus. There's this group called the Zealots and they were willing to violently overthrow the Romans. Barabbas in the other Gospels is very, like at the trial of Jesus, is very possibly a zealot. When the Romans caught zealots, when they broke up their groups, what did they do? They crucified them outside the gates of the city of Jerusalem, quite often, to show what would happen for those who oppose Rome. So the Zealots are like ancient terrorists. The Pharisees are the next group. The Pharisees are the masters of a building. Anyone know what the building is called? Or the Pharisees are usually associated with? A building in Jewish life that we still have today. A synagogue. Yes. The Pharisees are associated with the synagogue. So the Pharisees are the ones that like to be called rabbi. They're the ones who are originally, Pharisees come from their holiness movement. They show up at the time of the Babylonian exile and they're a holiness movement. They want people to be faithful to the law and faithful to the covenant. And so they desire to keep people faithful to the covenant by building a hedge around the law, creating a set of rules to live by so that even if you break the rules, you still haven't broken the commandment because they want people to be safe. And what you need to see, what you need to know about Pharisees is that it's a good desire. I think every table has had the snack thing. Is it full? Are they all filled? If they're not, that's okay. We need one more volunteer for the 30th. Okay, we have plenty of time. We'll tackle it with email. Um, for the fifth, Annette signed up. Um, that one is the one that we won't have class. The 5th of October is that first Tuesday in October that is the Shanley Pennon service. So maybe um, if you want to join them the next week, we can have extra. <laughs> um, okay, so the Pharisees are the masters of the synagogue. But one of the things that we also need to remember, because this is so easy to forget, the Pharisees get a lot of garbage from Jesus, and sometimes it's worth it. But do know that many Pharisees became followers of Jesus. It's very, very likely that some of the apostles were Pharisees. Paul was a Pharisee. So remember this when you start reading about them because it's easy to give Pharisees a bad name and to give Pharisees sort of the short end of the stick, but it's originally a desire for holiness. It's a desire for faithfulness. Now it goes awry and they get into trouble sometimes, but many of them were righteous. Many of them were true children of Israel. Many of them were preaching the truth. You encounter it, Jesus goes into many synagogues and some of them reject him, that's true, but some synagogues welcome him. Some of the leaders of the synagogues who were probably Pharisees welcomed Jesus. So you have to be careful because it's really easy to stereotype people. Like, oh, those Pharisees, they have these rules and they have all these rules and they get lost in their rules and they lose faith. That can happen, but it happens to us as well. There's many Pharisees that become Christians. Just remember that. Pharisaism the Pharisees are also the foundations of modern Orthodox Judaism after the fall of the temple. Another group called the Sadducees gets wiped out. So the Sadducees are the group that's in charge of the temple, which includes the priests and the Levites 
for the most part. Some priests and Levites, probably not, like Zechariah and Elizabeth, are probably much more in line with the Essenes or the Pharisees than the Sadducees. But the Sadducees essentially are those who have compromised with Rome. They've made this compromise, you let us keep our temple and we won't oppose Roman civil programs. So you could say they're a bit like the slimy political type. That religion should serve politics. Now again, we have to be careful because what are they trying to do? They're trying to preserve Jewish identity and the Jewish temple from the Romans. That's arguably a good desire. It's not that they're all bad, but that in compromising with the Romans, they've compromised the integrity of the faith. That's kind of the argument that the Pharisees make. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees are not friends. So the Sadducees are surrounded, or their big building is the temple. There's only one temple in Jerusalem. The Pharisees, their building is the synagogue. And there's lots of synagogues. In most towns, there was a synagogue. In larger towns, there's probably more than one. Um, the Sadducees are a group that also only says the first five books of the Bible are Scripture. So they only have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, they don't have the resurrection of the dead. There's no angels. There's no miracles. Those are all these kind of human things. The Pharisees, on the other hand, have the Jewish Old Testament. So it doesn't include the Greek books, but they also believe in angels. They believe in um, the resurrection of the dead. They have the resurrection of the body. Jesus is actually very, very theologically similar to the Pharisees. In fact, as far as I can tell, and as much as I remember, Jesus never really fights the Pharisees on theology. His proposal or his challenge to the Pharisees is you get caught in rules and you have these laws and this understanding that's wrong, but he doesn't critique their theology. When it comes to the Sadducees, he does. He says, you're completely wrong. You don't know the scriptures. You don't understand. Go back and read. So, again, it's important to remember that Jesus is very much theologically a Pharisee. He's theologically Jewish. A certain reading of Judaism and a certain reading of the Old Testament, yes. That's what they're proposing. But... Theologically, he doesn't say they're wrong. He says their practices are wrong, their human stuff is wrong, but they're right about God for the most part. The biggest argument with the Pharisees would be over God as a trinity, probably. Um, okay, then we have this last group. They're called the Essenes. And the Essenes were a quasi-religious community that had two major centers, well, three major centers, actually, in ancient Israel. Can anyone guess where they were? Any of you been to the Holy Land and the city of Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem? You'll note that there's an Essene quarter in Jerusalem. So there was a group, they don't quite call it that anymore, but even older maps will talk about the Essene quarter of Jerusalem and the Essene gate. So they had a community in Jerusalem. They had another community that's on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee in Qumran, which, or not the Sea of Galilee, the north shore of the Dead Sea, north and west of the Dead Sea. Most of the tour groups that are Christians will go visit Qumran um, because it's so important for John the Baptist. They had lots of baptisms in Mikveh, and we'll talk about those. Um, they have one more center of where they had the most influence. Anyone want to guess where it is? Jesus spends most of his time there. Capernaum? You're close. In the region of Galilee, which Capernaum is a part of. But the Essenes, their major centers were in Jerusalem 
and near the north shore of the Dead Sea and in Galilee. It's extremely, extremely likely that many, if not most, of the first disciples of Jesus were from or at least influenced by the Essene community. So the Essenes are kind of a quasi-religious order. They follow um, a man who they call the teacher of righteousness. It could be one of the high priests that left because the Essenes say the temple has been compromised and corrupted by its contact with the Romans and the Greeks before them. That it became political and it's no longer the place to worship God. So we're going to go out into the desert to prepare a highway for the Lord. It's the same language that John the Baptist uses. They had a teacher with a council of three and a larger council of 12 that ruled over them. It's the same structure that Jesus uses for the apostles, that there's Jesus and then uh, Peter, James, and John, the three, and then the 12. Um, the Essenes in general seem to have had a couple of different groups. One of them called the pure ones were those that left marriage behind. They weren't married, they were celibate, and they lived a life separated from the rest of the Jews because Jewish life had become corrupted by this contact with the Romans. But they were very spiritual. The Dead Sea Scrolls, if you've heard of them, which were so important for scriptural research, are Essene scriptures. They're Essene writings. They're the ones that wrote them and stuck them in a cave outside of Jerusalem where they lived. Um, John the Baptist seems to have been an Essene. He dressed like they did, he preaches like they do, but at some point John the Baptist recognizes a call from God that pushes him out of the community to begin to preach himself. Um, and there's all kinds of parts of the gospel. There's a guy, I think it's by John Bergsma, who's a scripture scholar who writes a book called Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, and it compares some of these sort of obscure passages in the scriptures with what we know about the Essenes. And his argument is actually that there's all kinds of things that make it sound like the Essenes were really important. For instance, Jesus, the word that's used for the room where Jesus and his disciples eat the Last Supper is this weird word that doesn't show up in a lot of places, but the Essenes used it for their guest houses. And if you go to the traditional site where Jesus ate the Last Supper with his apostles, it's outside the walls of the city of his time in the Essene Quarter. Um, in the Gospel of Mark, there's a young man that shows up at the end of the Gospel in the Garden of Gethsemane wearing a linen robe. And linen wasn't a usual material that they made clothes out of because it's very expensive and it's relatively itchy. But linen was worn by the high priest in the temple. It was what priesthood robes were made out of. And incidentally enough, it's what the Essenes made their clothes out of. They wore linen next to their skin because they were a community from the priesthood, most likely. But they were a community of priests who were living out in the desert to prepare the way of the Lord. Um, there's all of these connections with the Essenes that are really, really important um, that seem to happen in the life of Jesus and the life of the Apostle, or the, of St. John the Baptist. St. John the Baptist, for instance, it appears, was raised not necessarily by his parents who were old. They entrusted him to someone. Well, it just so happens that many Jewish families entrusted their children to the Essenes, where, who would raise them. They seem to have had another group of married people that followed the Essene way but didn't live lives of celibacy. Um, and it's extremely likely that many of the early apostles come from families that are like that. 
So people kind of looked up to them. They were holy ones. They spent their lives in prayer. They spent their lives preparing the way for the Messiah. Now, the Essenes, on the other hand, get a little apocalyptic and a little weird. You can read some of their scriptures and you're like, this is far out. Because um, it sounds a lot like the book of Revelation and it sounds like some of these other texts in the scriptures. So Jesus doesn't go totally in on the Essene thing. But there's a lot of the Essenes that um, become followers of Jesus. They cease to exist in history right around the time of the Roman invasion in 70 AD. They disappear. The community at Qumran is abandoned. And for many years, scholars didn't believe that they existed, except they showed up in the writings of people like Josephus, um, who was a Jewish historian at the time. And, you know, good old scholars got proved wrong because eventually they found the community at Qumran and they found the Essenes and they found their scriptures and then a lot of things made sense. Does anyone know when this happened? When, was, when were the Dead Sea Scrolls found? And when did they dig up Qumran? 1949. It's after World War II in the foundation of the modern state of Israel that was important for the Essenes. So there's a bunch of connections to these different groups for Jesus and for Christianity, particularly with the Essenes and the Pharisees. Um, not as much with the Zealots, although some. Christianity tends to take this idea of zeal for the house of the Lord and translate it into something spiritual and translate it into a desire to be faithful to the covenant, a desire to live in communion with God, that we should be zealous for the house of the Lord. That's commended in the scriptures many times, but Christianity very explicitly rejects violence um, in, as a way of spreading the gospel. And Christianity does not have a lot in common with the Sadducees. Um, they're probably the group that's furthest away. So the Pharisees, the Zealots, the Essenes, and the Sadducees. These are the four groups in ancient Israel. And they're good to know because John the Baptist comes from this group, probably was raised by the Essenes in the desert and ultimately leaves them. Some of the apostles are likely Essenes. Um, John Bergsma argues that Elizabeth and Zechariah are very likely at least sympathetic to the group. And that's how John ends up where he does. It's possible that Jesus spent some time with John and that his parents were familiar with them. They were present in the region of Galilee. We don't know exactly, but they would have been around. Um, they were sort of part of the mix. And this is important for us because ancient Judaism wasn't a monolithic religion. It wasn't that everyone was always on the same page. It's not that there's one source and one understanding that was happening in ancient Israel. There's actually a bunch of them. And it's a little bit like the modern world. And we don't always know who Jesus is in contact with as far as which groups they were sympathetic to. It's likely that when he's in synagogues, the people he would meet the most are Pharisees because they were the masters of the synagogue. But we don't always know. And the common people, the regular ordinary people, probably weren't all part of these groups. They were very likely sympathetic to some of them. You know, they had tendencies in a certain direction. But the normal people probably were a bit in the middle. Some of the things that the Essenes said about compromise with the Romans in the temple um, makes sense. For instance, the high priesthood was supposed to be for life. And if you remember in the story of Jesus, it talks about Annas, who was high priest that year, or Caiaphas. Well, if you're priest for life, you can't be priest for a year. And you get the impression in the story of Jesus that the high priest is not just a religious figure who's in charge of the temple service, but that the high priest is also a political figure who's acting politically that would prove the Essenes right, that the priesthood had become corrupted, that it had left its place in religion 
and gotten into politics and it got in trouble. So there's, there's things like this that are happening in the gospel and it's one of the most important pieces of the background because if you read the gospels carefully, there's several times where it actually tells you who Jesus is talking to. And the theological debates or the questions will make a lot more sense. So Jesus will show up with the Pharisees, for instance, and they'll ask, why are your disciples eating, picking heads of grain and eating them on the Sabbath? That's against the law. And it says they're Pharisees. Right? So if you pay attention to those little pieces of the scripture, a lot of that is actually written in there. We just forget to read it. We forget to bring this kind of context and this understanding to situations like that. And that's what I meant when I was talking about the characters being round, of putting some of the scriptures and the context and the history and this understanding back into the scriptures, is that when you do that, you'll be able to answer my questions better. You see, there is a method to the madness. But you also start to understand a lot better what's happening in the gospel. Like the Sadducees aren't worried about who picks heads of grain on the Sabbath. They don't care. They've compromised with the Romans. They've abandoned most of those tenets of faith. As long as you do our thing and you pay temple taxes, we're satisfied. But the Pharisees, the holiness movement, and so for instance, the Pharisees consider faithfulness to the law by the people of Israel, that if people are unfaithful to the law, then God will destroy the nation. Why? Because he did. In the Babylonian exile, they were unfaithful to the law. They had these concerns about idolatry. They kept worshiping foreign idols. And what happened? The Babylonians wrecked the entire city. They destroyed the temple. They carried off the people into exile. And the whole world went to hell in a handbasket. At least if you were Jewish. Right? So the Pharisees have some historical background for their thought. Like, if we're not faithful, if you're not faithful, if you're violating the law, then God is going to destroy it. Oddly enough, Jesus says, I'm going to destroy this temple and in three days raise it up. And he switches the context on them. So, these groups are important. And like I said, I think it's worth spending some time with. It means that we didn't get very far today. But, um, it is... If you remember these groups, it will be important because this is not the last time we'll encounter them. Make sense? At least a little bit? Okay, so the next time we'll meet is on October 12th, uh, which is, I think, the second Tuesday in October. Um, so it looks like for snacks that day will be Annette and Char Feldman and Mary Kerba. Um, so thank you to them. I will send out this whole thing in my next little flock note thing. Is anyone not getting the flock note? I don't think I sent one this last week, so it's kind of cheating, but the week before. Last week was a really crazy week, and hopefully this week is calmer. Um, but I'll try and make sure that you're added to the flock note thing. I might have to add you guys, Russ and Loretta. I don't remember if you're in there, but I'll look. Because um, it has a link to the notes and it has the other things, so it's, it's just an easy way to do it. Um, if you will pray for us as well, I'm giving a retreat to the deacons and their wives this weekend. So I will be gone. And then next week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, um, Father Ross and I will be in Jamestown for the Presbyterate Days. Um, so will be gone for a few days. I think that there will be a Wednesday evening Mass next week. But Monday and Tuesday there won't be Mass here. Well, I shouldn't say that. Pray for Father Ross too because he scheduled himself into a pickle and he has a wedding on a Tuesday in the middle of uh, the most important diocesan meeting of the year. So he has to figure out how he's going to do that uh, because he scheduled a wedding on a Tuesday. 
And it's sometimes you just can't save people from themselves. <laughs> but in this case, in this case, it's also a special day for the couple. Um, it's Patty's son. He's getting married on a Tuesday. <laughs> It's a special and meaningful day for the couple, but he probably shouldn't have scheduled it on the Tuesday of Presbyterate days. <laughs> so um, Father Ross may be around a little bit more. You'll have to pay attention to uh, the bulletin or announcements because there may be a mass or two here because Father Ross will likely be here uh, that other parishes won't have. So we'll meet again on the 12th of October. We'll continue in chapter one. I told you we would slow down a little bit, but I'm also going to try and work ahead and get like future chapters of the gospel done so they'll be part of the document and we won't get caught later. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A couple of things really quickly. If I could have someone from each table, there's two buckets of soapy water and some rags up on the um, silver counter. Someone from each table could wipe it off really quick. That would be helpful. And if you ordered a book in the office from someone like Barb, we have a few books that people are waiting for, or books that are waiting for people. So, um, if you have one, you may need to pick it up.